This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone had a nice weekend. Um, I'm going to, this is absolutely true. So July 28th, 29th of this year, we're about to enter August 1st. And I said, Pooja, you got to get on the ball. I have to find grand round speaker for the early fall, September, you know, 12th, 18th. Nobody's going to volunteer for that. So tomorrow I have got to send out a bunch of emails. It was one of my things to do. I wake up the next day, first email of the day, Michael McDaniel <laughs> emails me and says, do you have any openings for early fall to present? I had to read it three times. Does it really say early fall? <laughs> so thank you. Um, I've had the pleasure of introducing Dr. McDaniel almost every year, I think. Um, and he recently presented at our sex-specific uh, cardiovascular health and medicine conference as well. Uh, Dr. McDaniel, everybody knows, is an associate professor at Emory and adjunct appointment at Morehouse School of Medicine. He has directed the cath lab at Grady for the past 12 years. So congratulations. <laughs> Dr. McDaniel graduated with me from the Medical College of Georgia and did his internal medicine and cardiology fellowship here at Emory and then did his interventional year here as well. Uh, he's actively involved in the development of PERC teams, involved in numerous committees related to quality and ACS care. He's on the editorial board of clinical cardiology, and he is going to tell us what do we need to know about, sudden, uh, about stable ischemic heart disease today. <laughs> Thank you, Pooja, I appreciate it. Um, so I have uh, no conflicts related to this talk. So we're gonna talk about what can Jerry Seinfeld teach us about stable ischemic heart disease, probably an unusual topic. Um, Seinfeld was one of the uh, shows I loved watching growing up on NBC uh, every Thursday night back when shows were on television. Uh, for the fellows, they probably don't know what that means. But um, so one of my favorite episodes was called The Opposite Episode. I was gonna play a clip, but just for the sake of time, uh, just going to go through it and summarize it. So George, uh, George, who's kind of the loser in the group, came in one day and said, every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. My life is the opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, it's all been wrong. To which Jerry says, well, if every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. And so George took this to heart and really thought about it and then embraced this. And to those who know the episode well, he changed his sandwich order at the, at the restaurant to the opposite of what he would normally get. He, he had an opposite approach to his instincts with, with women and started having success in dating. He took the opposite approach to what he thought he should do at work and ended up getting uh, hired by George Steinbrenner and the New York Yankees to his dream job. And by the end of the episode, by doing the opposite of what he thought he should do, he ended up on top of the world. So in some in the business world have referred to this as the Costanza rule, when you should ignore your instincts and just do the opposite. So I know that the question is, well, what does this have to do with cardiology and stable ischemic heart disease? And I think over the last few years, as I've gone to journal club with Dr. King and others, we usually will be uh, invited to a restaurant by Dr. Douglas, and um, there's uh, one of our fellows will present one of our major New England papers on stable ischemic heart disease. And increasingly, I've just felt like George Costanza as I've left these journal clubs thinking the treatment of stable ischemic heart disease is really the opposite of everything I thought. Every instinct I've had about the diagnosis and management of stable CAD, it's all been wrong. So why this pessimism and why feeling like this when we read some of these? Um, well, we know that there's a lot of data out there about ischemia and ischemia testing. And the more ischemia is obviously very predictive of adverse outcomes. And, and so the more, more ischemia you have, the worse your survival. And so one of the uh, hypotheses that we've had, and it makes intuitive sense and obvious sense that if we can just reduce this ischemia and re through revascularization and return the ischemia back to normal, we should uh, change these survival curves. But although the hypothesis seems very intuitive and very easy, it's been harder to prove in, in, in uh, practice. 
So I think everybody's familiar with the ischemia trial. I don't think we need to go through this in much detail, but for those that may not know, the ischemia trial really set out to ask this question of whether uh, those with moderate to severe ischemia um, and uh, would, could be improved through revascularization. In that trial, they uh, found patients with a moderate to severe ischemia. They actually um, had to do a CT scan to make sure they had coronary disease. And we'll come back to this fact at the end. Um, and then got randomized to a conservative or more of an invasive approach. And uh, revascularization could be done with uh, PCI or cabbage, most of it with PCI. And I think everybody's familiar with the results of the ischemia trial, over 5,000 patients, all with moderate to severe ischemia, randomized to medical therapy or medical therapy and revascularization. And over a five-year time period, there was no impact on mortality, despite there being uh, an enriched population of diabetics, of LED disease, of multivessel disease. And even then when you go back and say, well, maybe we didn't have enough ischemia in this trial. And you look at really just the cohort with the most severe ischemia on all cause mortality, there was no improvement in uh, the cohort with the most severe ischemia with revascularization. And I think this is, uh, I think many know this, but it's, uh, you know, it's similar to what we've seen before in some of our other trials, like the COURAGE trial that was done Decade before that, over 2,000 patients randomized medical therapy or medical therapy with revascularization. In this study, it was bare metal stent era. Uh, again, all these patients had normal LV function. These were, these were stable ischemic heart disease. And there was a fair bit of diabetics and multivessel disease. And again, no impact on mortality. And this is in line with the Berry 2D study also, over 2,300 diabetics, normal LV function, stable ischemic heart disease, randomized to medical therapy or medical therapy and revascularization. And again, uh, no impact on survival with revascularization. And, and in this trial, kind of like the ischemia trial, there was there, there, you could get revascularization with either P, PCI or cabbage, and there was no survival advantage to either revascularization uh, strategy. Um, uh, in the uh, Berry 2D uh, trial. And then if you look at the totality of the evidence of 14 randomized trials, almost 15,000 randomized patients uh, with stable ischemic heart disease, normal LV function, randomized to revascularization or medical therapy, uh, no impact on mortality in these uh, randomized trials. So you can kind of see how we may uh, see some of this data and feel like some of these hypotheses that we have uh, may not... Um, be what we thought they were. Now, the, I think the interesting story in the ischemia trial was around myocardial infarction. And in the total trial, in the ischemia trial, there was no impact of uh, revascularization or the invasive approach on myocardial infarction. But what you started to see is that there was some um, emerging data about differences. And so up front, there seemed to be more periprocedural myocardial infarctions in uh, the invasive strategy, but with time that changed and actually there was less uh, myocardial infarctions over time, probably due to less spontaneous myocardial infarctions with the invasive strategy. And of course, when you go back and you looked and you looked at different definitions for myocardial infarction, um, you could come to sort of different conclusions in the ischemia trial based on different definitions used. And certainly, when you go back and look at the non-procedural or the spontaneous myocardial infarctions in the ischemia trial, the invasive approach did reduce the rate of spontaneous myocardial infarctions compared to a conservative strategy. And this data is really in line with probably the totality of data in the, in the uh, randomized um, uh, trials where, although there's been lots of different ways of defining spontaneous MI, in total in these uh, randomized trials and stable ischemic heart disease, those that get revascularization do seem to have uh, less, um, less uh, spontaneous myocardial infarctions. But interestingly, despite improving myocardial infarctions, this doesn't seem to have any impact on mortality. Now, I thought this was interesting because you would think that if you were reducing non-fatal MIs, you should be reducing fatal MIs and you should reduce fatal, uh, you should reduce total mortality, but it's not what you're seeing. And uh, this has been seen in a lot of the clinical trials. And I found this interesting until I saw this um, trial, which I think is one of the more interesting trials that's been looked at in the last couple of years. And they looked at the, the surrogacy of non-fatal MI as it relates to a surrogate for total mortality or cardiovascular mortality in our randomized trials. And so the idea behind this is that 
um, in an effort to improve clinical trials that, that a MACE composite was developed to uh, increase the number of events so that we could study things faster, that you could reduce the number of patients that go into clinical trials, that you could have numbers uh, increase. Um, so you have the events increase, so the numbers would go down, you could do clinical trials faster and quicker. Makes complete sense, it's very intuitive. And so non-fatal MI was subsequently incorporated as an endpoint into really every landmark study of, of coronary disease over the last you know, 30 years or so. And it's really based on the assumption that preventing a non-fatal MI would then thus reduce a fatal myocardial infarction, which would then reduce total mortality. So that, and this is a belief that I think that's uh, pretty common um, uh, uh, in, in, um, in, as we look at the MACE outcome. But when the authors looked at it, they looked at over a million patients from 144 randomized trials with about 6 million patient year follow-up what they found is that there was no relationship between the reductions of non-fatal events in these trials and total mortality. This is the uh, statistical analysis of this. We won't go through this. We could, it would be a really interesting journal club to do. Um, but what they found is that there was really no relationship between the reduction of non-fatal MI and mortality. Now, what was interesting is that when you kind of broke down these trials, and this was sort of the who's who of clinical trials, the big, big, the big trials, the big landmark trials uh, in, in cardiology, that if you look at those that were published in before 2000, that there was a relationship uh, between, or there was at least some, some relationship between uh, non-fatal MI and mortality, but it was really in these last 20, 25 years where we've lost this relationship and it may be perhaps that some of the way we're defining a myocardial infarction today uh, compared to how we've done this in the past. But the authors found their conclusion was that we found no trial level correlation between non-fatal MI and all cause or cardiovascular mortality. And I think their, their conclusion then is thus interventions that reduce non-fatal MI cannot be assumed to reduce mortality, which is a really interesting idea um, and may be counter to what we often think. Now, this got some press and I, I thought I would just share one thing that, that was uh, in, in print because I thought it was an interesting way of, of looking at this. And, and they, the authors in this, um, in this article said, well, this flies in the face of what every cardiologist encountered when treating patients who present to the emergency department with acute MI only to die in the cath lab or the hospital. We all agree that death is on the natural pathway of MI in some people, but this is really asking a different question, which is if you can reduce the occurrence of MI, however you define it, do you alter mortality? And the answer is really no. And so I think that at the heart of this is some of the controversies of how we define myocardial infarction. And you can see lots of things in the, um, lots of articles out there, you know, definitions everywhere. Uh, but maybe none that fit. Has the fourth universal definition improved risk stratification? And then, of course, in the Excel trial, you know, controversies around imaginary definitions of myocardial infarction. And you can see at the heart of this is there's a lot of controversy about the definitions of what an MI is. And then, of course, clinically speaking, we all know that it can be very challenging to figure out which patients have myocardial injury and which patients have myocardial infarction. And so you can imagine the adjudication of this in clinical trials is just as difficult. So the authors of this trial, of this paper, they said, well, inclusion of non-fatal MI as an endpoint of randomized trials may still be justified based on its association with impaired quality of life and increased use of healthcare resources, but not based on its surrogacy for mortality, which I think is a really interesting finding and actually somewhat profound if, if we think about it and how we interpret our clinical trials. And I think what they're saying is that we've put MACE as a, as a, up on a pedestal as being a very hard outcome with hard events, but it may not be as hard of an outcome as we thought it, with the inclusion of non-fatal MI. And maybe this is a little bit softer of an endpoint for clinical trials, somewhere closer to hospitalizations and revascularizations and, and, and a little bit softer towards quality of life and not really as hard of an endpoint as we may thought. So this may be also why we kind of feel like this when we look at some of our data is it may be some of the interpretation of what 
their, these clinical trial results really mean in clinical practice. Now, I think where we don't disagree is that uh, revascularization does improve symptoms. This is the uh, quality of life and the angina uh, uh, data from the ischemia trial. And there was a statistically significant improvement in quality of life and angina with revascularization compared to a conservative approach. But if you're squinting in the back of the room, it, the, these, these curves are not super impressive in terms of the way you look at it. It's not, it's not as, as impressive as we would have liked at a population level. And then of course, there's the ischemia CKD um, group, which was the ischemia CKD was a parallel trial to the ischemia trial of over uh, 700 patients with CKD. This uh, occurred at the same time uh, as the ischemia trial, but actually ran in parallel, um, randomized to the invasive and conservative approach, just like the, the overall ischemia trial. But in the ischemia CKD population, they found an initial invasive strategy did not demonstrate a reduced risk of clinical outcomes, but they also found no improvement in quality of life in those with advanced renal failure or um, in end-stage renal disease or advanced uh, renal disease. And then this is another paper that we did in our journal clubs um, more recently where uh, we found that the, where the authors concluded that most angina resolves without treatment. So this was the clarify registry. There's a lot of issues with this study, but they took patients with uh, obstructive coronary disease and those that had baseline angina. And within the first year, half of the angina, had, half of the patients, the angina had gone away. And over the next three to five years, the majority had had resolution. But what was interesting is that angina regressed without medical in, intervention and revascularization in the vast majority of cases. So it wasn't interventions or medical therapy that led to this resolution. It was actually the tincture of time that led to this in the majority of the, of the patients and the, and the, the angina resolved without event uh, in these patients. And then of course, there's the orbited trial, which we could also talk for another hour on, but this is another humbling uh, uh, um, uh, uh, article that we went over in our journal club. It was a small trial and, and I think it has a lot of issues. Uh, we could talk about all the issues. Uh, 230 patients with stable CAD randomized to intervention or a sham procedure. And the authors found that PCI did not increase exercise time, angina class, metrics of the Seattle angina questionnaire, nor quality of life compared to a sham procedure. Now there's a lot of issues with this. We could talk for length about this and maybe at the end we can talk about some of the issues in this paper. And I think all of us would agree that everything we do in medicine has a placebo effect, uh, but I don't think that the only impact of revascularization for our patients is just a placebo effect. But what I thought was interesting and the reason I put this into this talk was there was a a uh, quote in the orbited trial that I thought was really interesting um, and didn't really get as much um, attention. In the discussion, they said, clinicians have hoped that there might be a simple entity named ischemia, which manifests as a positive test in clinical symptoms, and that treatment by PCI would eliminate these manifestations concordantly. But the Im implication is that perhaps this paradigm isn't so simple and ischemia isn't so simple. And I think at the heart of this is when I look at this is that I think what our hope was that we could go take a patient history and then order a non-invasive test for ischemia and that this would tell us which patients needed invasive angiography. And then this, this would then lead to a clinical impact for uh, a clinical benefit for our patients. But perhaps this paradigm isn't so simple and again, maybe the reason for feeling like this when we see some of the trial results. So the questions are, if, we, if some of these instincts are wrong, then would the opposite be right? And so if you go back and you look at this paradigm, what if instead of doing a subjective history, we also added an objective history along with it with an exercise treadmill test? Uh, I, I love exercise treadmill tests. Um, it's an objective evidence of uh, symptoms and severity, and it can reduce the discordant diagnosis between those that maybe one doctor thinks it's typical angina, somebody else thinks it's maybe more non-cardiac chest pain. And so when you put the patient on the treadmill, you can look at the symptoms, you can look, when do they start? You know, why does the patient stop? 
um, when they when they go when they stop, does the pain go away with rest, or do you can give them a nitroglycerin? You can look at their total exercise time. You can come up with an objective angina class, and you say, well, well, angina is really supposed to be something that you get by the history. And I think that this is a, a humbling um, analysis of the discordance between cardiologists and patients' estimation of angina. So this was a outpatient study of over 155 cardiologists and 1,257 uh, outpatient visits with patients with coronary disease. And uh, the doctor and the patient walk in the room, they talk about their symptoms, and then they walked out of the office, and then they fill out a Seattle Angina questionnaire. And in over 70% of the time, the cardiologist either over or underestimated the severity of their angina compared to what the, at least the patients were saying. And, and the, the author's conclusions was that there was substantial discordance between what patient reported and cardiologist estimated as their burden of angina. And if we're about symptoms, that this could mean that we could over or underestimate the uh, risk benefit ratio for uh, revascularization and invasive strategies. But at the heart of it is also, well, how good is this Seattle angina questionnaire? And so if you go back and you look at John Spurtis's original papers where he came up with the uh, Seattle Angina questionnaire, you can look at how some of these uh, questions uh, correlated with time on the treadmill. And, and there's not a lot of data in his publications, but you can see that there is a relationship. It's not random, but it's also not a strong relationship in terms of how these questions perform to their actual exercise time. So in total, what you can kind of see is that sometimes when we uh, do our histories, we may not actually always be hearing exactly what the patient may be saying, but the patient also may not actually be saying what they're actually doing. They may be trying to tell us something, but it may not always be exactly what we heard. We, 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 we were interested in this and we set up a quality project at Grady. Unfortunately, this got um, interrupted by COVID and a, and a flood. And so we ended up with a small number of patients and this is unpublished. And so take it with a grain of salt. But what we were interested in is we took patients coming to the stress lab and we had our APPs ask them a couple questions. Does this sound like angina? Do you have chest pain with exertion? Is it relieved by rest or nitroglycerin? And then how uh, severe it is at the, at the angina class? Then immediately we put them on the treadmill and then we exercised them and we asked them the exact same questions again. So subjective history versus objective history. And almost universally, some part of the history changed from their subjective to the objective. And in two thirds of patients where we thought they had typical angina by their history, they ended up not having typical angina when we exercised them on the treadmill. And I think that, you know, the nice things about the treadmill test, you don't have to actually get them to 85% to look for their, you just have to do the most that they can do to assess their angina and their risk. And then of course, there's lots of different protocols to make it easier for people who can't exercise. And then in addition to their angina, you, you do get a lot of information about risk in terms of uh, VT, ST elevations, low workload, ST depressions, and hypotension. And then, so when you go back and you look at the ischemia trial and the, and the impact of revascularization on symptoms, you can see that the probably the reason that the benefits were, were, were so mild was that a lot of the patient population, 35% were asymptomatic and, and, and half were only mildly symptomatic. And so, but when you go back and you look by angina frequency and angina severity, there is a massive and dramatic improvement with revascularization in those that have severe angina. But there's really minimal benefit if you don't have much angina. But only 20% of the population had the severe angina. And so that when you look at it at the population level, the impact is minimal. But at the at the those that had severe angina, it's actually pretty dramatic. And so the guidelines say that the reason for revascularization is to improve symptoms. And they say this, that the most, this is most pronounced in patients with more frequent angina at baseline, but yet sometimes we don't actually quantify or qualify the amount of angina and the amount of risk. So going back to this paradigm, well, what if in addition to doing an objective treadmill to see their objective uh, exercise limitations, instead of looking for ischemia and then using that to decide who needs evasive angiography, what if we look for anatomy with coronary CTA. Um, I, I'm a big fan of coronary CTA. I, I, the Scott Hart trial is a nice uh, trial that looked at the addition of CTA to exercise treadmill testing. 
Um, it was over 4,000 patients that were randomized to a treadmill alone or a treadmill and a CT. And if you had the treadmill and the CTA, you had better events over time. Now, this was driven by non-fatal MI, so we can uh, talk about what that might mean, whether this is through differences in hospitalizations or revascularizations. But there was an improvement, and probably what it was is that if you got, did more CTs, you found more coronary disease, you put them on more preventive therapy, and that this led to some of that better outcomes. But there wasn't any difference in uh, invasive angiography or revascularization with this. And the combination of a treadmill and a CT is actually much less expensive than a, a, a SPECT uh, with about a 60% reduction in cost with the combination of these two together. And so when we look at, um, uh, in, there's, there's been a lot of uh, analysis of uh, the use of uh, elective angiography and the low diagnostic yield. There's a lot of normal casts that are done. And so this is one, um, look at this, this was done a, a while ago, but I think a lot, of these, um, a lot of these trends still hold up. This was probably the largest look from the NCDR cath uh, PCI registry. And those that in the elective that, that came for angiography, there was about a 60% risk a rate of um, non-obstructive disease and almost 40% of them were completely normal caths. And I think that one of the reasons for this was is the rate of a high false positives uh, using SPECT. So when you go to look at the uh, PROMISE data, um, which randomized 10,000 patients in the, in the outpatient clinics to the use of CTA or an ischemic strategy, most of this was SPECT, um, you found that, that if you went to the cath lab based on your spec findings, there was about a 52% risk of having non-obstructive rates. And non-obstructive is defined as 50% stenosis at cath. So if you actually talk about finding ischemic disease by FFR positivity, these, these, rates, would, these rates would be even higher. And that these rates are reduced with the use of coronary CTA. And when you go back to the ischemia trial, you know, one of the goals is to find those patients with left main disease. And unfortunately, none of the um, factors on non-invasive nuclear imaging could independently predict left main disease. And TID, which is one of the classic things that we say is more often uh, was not observed more commonly, at least in the ischemia analysis of those with left main disease. But one of the only things that actually was predictive of left main disease was exercising your patient on a treadmill where you saw that lower METs and greater ST depression. So not that EKG can predict left main disease, but it's a better predictor. The exercise is a better predictor than the nuclear images. And then of course, we do know the flip side is the problem sometimes with normal nuclear stress tests. And we know that if you take patients with multivessel coronary disease and you look at what are their findings on non-invasive imaging, one in five can have normal perfusion due to balanced ischemia. Probably the same as left main, it's probably the same thing with left main disease. So you can miss one in five patients if you only focus on uh, those with normal perfusion um, uh, in those that have multivessel disease, you can miss those due to balanced ischemia. So when you go back and you look at the ischemia trial, they realized this, that you really couldn't use ischemia testing in and of itself as a gatekeeper for the lab. And that's why they used coronary CT as really the true gatekeeper in the ischemia trial for the invasive versus the conservative approach. Now, the other part to uh, the low diagnostic yield for elective coronary angiography is probably the use of pretest probability. And I think that this is a table that um, has been shown probably in every guideline and every uh, board review tests probably for the last 30 years or so uh, where we've been taught Diamond and Foster uh, estimates of pretest probability. And so based on these, these tables, what we've all been taught is that if you have a middle-aged person and they have some risk factors and they come in with typical angina, we've been taught that they have 80 to 90% risks of having rates of having um, obstructive coronary disease at left heart catheterization. But when you actually looked at these rates in the real world, what we found is that the, the predicted way overestimated the actual observed rates. And this has been shown in, in several trials now. One of the larger ones was the CONFIRM registry, again, where they looked at patients of different age and they looked at the different types of angina that they may have. And then they, they, they did the expected based on Diamond and Foster. And then they looked at what they observed. And the predicted leads to about a threefold higher 
incidence uh, or is threefold higher than what you actually find in, in practice. And so this has been understood now and the new guidelines and the ESC guidelines have updated these data tables for pretest probability um, with, with new updated um, uh, uh, values. And so, and so where we used to teach patients who had middle age with typical angina likely had coronary disease, the, the teaching is actually if you're middle aged with a typical angina, you, you don't likely have obstructive coronary disease. It's not that you don't have it, it's just that the likelihood is much lower than what we thought, about a threefold uh, less. Now the ACC guidelines, uh, the chest pain guidelines that were just released also came to the same conclusion. They actually went one step further and they took out the ideas of using typical and atypical altogether. The, the rationale for it is that um, those descriptors don't really predict Seattle angina question, uh, Seattle angina um, uh, scores very well. And so they just took out the typical, atypical, non-cardiac altogether in, in, in looking at pretest probability and basically just said, if you're middle-aged and you have chest pain, it's on the lower side of having um, coronary disease, of obstructive coronary disease. It's not that you don't have it, it's just not as high as that we used to. And so when you look at the uh, chest pain guidelines, they recommend uh, anatomic or functional testing in those with stable ischemic heart disease prior to invasive angiography. And so the idea is, you know, maybe the CT is the better um, uh, gatekeeper to the cath lab than ischemia testing. And this was looked at it in the discharge trial. So this was a trial of over 3,600 patients um, who were referred um, by their cardiologist for invasive angiography. And they got randomized to either going on to getting their invasive angiography or they or half, the other half went for CT first. And if you went uh, to CT first, there was no price to be paid. In fact, the, the, there was a, a slight trend in the other direction, non-significant. But what you found is if you, got, if you got referred to CT, well, if you got referred to invasive angiography, there was a lot of invasive angiography, but the rates of invasive angiography were reduced if you got referred to CT probably because you got rid of some of the false positive nuclear patients. You got rid of some of the high pretest probability patients who have normal coronary disease. And probably some of this is maybe some of your cardiomyopathy patients who have non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. And so then if you do less procedures, you have less procedural complications. And again, this was seen in another trial um, looking at it, it's the same concept of 1,600 patients referred for angiography going to either invasive angiography or CT. Again, you look at rates of invasive angiography similar to what was shown before, and this resulted in less cost. So this is reducing your total cost, reducing complications, and you're ending up really in the same point. You're still finding those patients with a lot of coronary disease. It's just that you're getting rid of the non the, the normal calves uh, that would normally go to, to invasive angiography. And so if you look at the updated um, ACC chest pain guidelines, you can see that both anatomic testing and stress testing, which, so CTA or SPECT, um, they're both class one, but, but the wording is different. And I think it's really worth reading the words because it's interesting. So for anatomic testing, CTA, for intermediate high-risk patients with stable chest pain, and this is those that have no known coronary disease. So a couple caveats, this is outpatient stable, and this is people you don't know what you're going to find. This is not patients with prior bypass or prior PCI or, or that population. CTA is effective for the diagnosis of coronary disease because you can see if they have coronary disease. You can, it's for risk stratification, more, more disease, more calcium, more atherosclerosis, more burden, more risk, and for guiding treatment decisions. You know where the, the anatomy is. You can decide if you go on for cath. You may uh, think about doing this for lots of different reasons. Whereas for stress testing, same thing, that stress testing is, is effective for the diagnosis of ischemia and for estimating risk of MACE. But it doesn't say that it's recommended to diagnose coronary disease, no, nor for treatment decisions. And so I think that one of the ways I sort of put this together is that the CTA is really a diagnostic test. It can, it can tell you if there's coronary disease, and then you can decide on medical therapy, you could decide on on uh, calf and moving on towards revascularization, but you don't really know what you're dealing with with SPECT. It's more of a prognostic test, but it doesn't tell you what you're, 
what your really underlying disease is. We were talking about this with the fellows um, the other day in the fellows conference and, and the question came up, well, if I have, can, if, can I follow the ischemia trial? If I have a middle-aged person who's got some symptoms and they've got a big 15% reversible defect, can I medically manage that patient? And the question is, well, what disease are you medically managing? Does that patient have left main disease? Does that patient have multivessel disease? Does that patient have single vessel disease with significant functional limitations? Or does that patient have a false positive stress test? And you don't know the answer to that based just on the stress testing. And so you need sort of the anatomic testing to really uh, make your diagnosis. Now, a huge, huge, huge caveats to this. This is for patients who you don't know what you're gonna find when you're there. This does not apply to the people who have had prior PCI, who have prior cabbage. This is also probably not those that have uh, you know, significant C CKD or on dialysis or have wicked calcifications on, on CT because you'll get non-diagnostic CT. So CTA has a lot of issues, uh, but this is sort of for the garden variety patient who you're seeing for the first time. And of course, the big thing, this is for stable CAD. This is the outpatient population. This is not acute chest pain that we see in the ED or CDU. That's a different patient population with different algorithms. And we could spend probably a whole other grand rounds probably talking about that, that population. But I think that the, the goals in acute chest pain are very different than the goals in stable chest pain. One of the big goals in acute chest pain is sending patients home. That's probably the bigger overriding goal than making a diagnosis. So when you look at the stable ischemic heart disease guidelines, this is their summary slide. And they, they put up there that the indications for revascularization are, are really twofold, to improve symptoms and to improve survival. And they're anatomic indications for survival. So if that's what the revascularization guidelines are about symptoms and anatomy, then maybe that should be our approach is looking for symptoms with treadmills and anatomy with CTA. And so a lot of times fellows will ask me, which does my patient need a cath? And the patients who probably need caths are based on their anatomy. If they have left main disease, they have multivessel disease in low EFs, or maybe they have multivessel disease. There's probably survival reasons based on these anatomic things, and they probably need invasive angiography and need uh, revascularization. But on the other end of the spectrum are the patients who not necessarily need a cath, but who may want a cath, and those are those to improve their symptoms and their quality of life. Those would be the patients with single vessel disease or double vessel disease and functional limitations on those treadmills those can improve your symptoms and, and improve um, quality of life. Now, uh, the, the, the last part of the, this was actually where my talk, my, my talk was going to end uh, when, I, when I asked Pooja uh, to sign up to do this, but I had to add one more chapter to it because I think it's interesting and that based on the uh, recent European guideline, uh, re, re, European uh, cardiology uh, conference and the publication of the REVIVE trial. We're actually gonna do this tomorrow in Journal Club, so I hope I'm not stealing the thunder of the fellows tomorrow, but I, but I think this will be sort of similar uh, to some of the other ones. And so uh, just a step backwards. So cabbage is recommended to improve survival in multivessel disease and low EFs. And this is a class one indication in the guidelines and, 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 they, and they single out the cabbage is the one uh, therapy that, and they base this on the STITCH trial. I think many patients are, many people are probably familiar with the STITCH uh, trial, but it's worth a relook again, uh, just uh, to put it in context. So 1,200 patients with ischemic cardiomyopathies, multivessel disease, low EFs, were randomized to revascularization with cabbage or just to an optimal medical therapy strategy. And what they found is if you got randomized to cabbage, actually there's early harm. So if you look in the first year or two, there's actually numerically, maybe not statistically, but more mortality with revascularization. Now that harm, that early harm goes away within two to three years and you see a crossing of the survival curves favoring uh, revascularization with cabbage. Now the original uh, trial endpoint was a five-year trial. And it was, when it came out, it was published, it was a negative trial. There was a separation of these curves, but these separations were not statistically significant at the time of the initial publication. And there was some controversy around 
the differences between the intention to treat and the and the um, those that you know as treated. And uh, but with time, they followed these patients along, and there was an improvement in mortality with revascularization. Uh, with about a 7% absolute reduction, the number needed to treat was 14%, uh, four, number, not 14%, 14, um, but this took 10 years. And so it really took five to 10 years for this survival advantage to emerge. So a, a couple things about that. I mean, one is it is a pretty robust 7% reduction, absolute for, number needed to treat of 14. That's a pretty good number needed to treat. With that said, the, the negative or the class half empty way to look at it is it takes time to get there. We're not making major impacts in the next, next year or two in the majority of the patients. And it takes five to 10 years for this to accrue. And even in, in, the, in the randomized trial, which is usually a less sick group, you know, two thirds of the patients are, 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 have, have, have passed away by 10 years. So kind of humbling um, that a lot of these patients are dying despite even the, the best of care. So you can see that in the guidelines, cabbage is a class one indication for ischemic cardiomyopathy. But the, the, the revascularization guidelines left out, well, what do you do if you can't do a cabbage, should you do PCI? And they just left it blank because there really was no data to fill in this blank. And so that was the what, what led to the REVIVE trial. So the REVIVE trial, 700 patients, so smaller than stitch, multivessel disease, uh, low EFs, randomized to PCI or OM medical therapy. And so the, over three and a half years, so not, not as long a duration of, of follow-up, there was no improvement in the rates of death or heart failure revascularization with revascularization with PCI. And then if you looked at the individual outcomes of mortality, despite about a third of the population dying, there was no improvements with revascularization nor heart failure hospitalizations over a three and a half year follow-up. So you have to put this, I think, in context of STITCH. STITCH may have been in this sort of similar range had they published their results at three and a half years. So the question is, will we see separation from three and a half years out to 10 years? And, and only time will tell. Or is there something different about cabbage that's different than PCI in terms of its survival? And I don't know that we know until we see this follow-up. But this is why I wanted to put this in here because I thought that this was interesting and this was, this was surprising to me. So when they looked at the improvement in ejection fraction with revascularization um, over six to 12 months, there was really no improvement in the ejection fraction with revascularization compared to optimal medical therapy. And what was interesting then is they said that, that this was similar to what was seen in the STITCH trial, which surprised me because I hadn't really heard that published in this with the stitch. So I went back and looked at the stitch data. And sure enough, when, when you did cabbage for multivessel disease and reduced EFs, it also did not improve the ejection fractions compared to optimal medical therapy alone. Um, so uh, this was over about four uh, months. Um, now there was some changes in LV dimensions, but the ejection fraction, which is really sort of our marker of um, LV function was not improved uh, with revascularization. And when you looked in the STITCH trial, they found no differences in mortality, whether your ejection fraction improved or didn't improve. Um, and they, they concluded in the STITCH trial that our results, and this is with surgical revascularization, that reversal of left ventricular systolic dysfunction is not a critical mechanism involved in the beneficial survival effects of cabbage, which is really interesting because I think so much of what we do is when we find a cardiomyopathy, we go look for multivessel coronary disease so that we can, re we can revascularize it so that we can improve the ejection fraction so that we can then make the survival better. But that's not what at least Stitch and Revived would say. Uh, now, these are two small studies. I'm just I'm, uh, so these are by no way definitive, but this is the author's conclusions. And I thought this was interesting. They said these findings challenge the paradigm of myocardial hibernation, which is classically defined according to improvement in left ventricular volumes and function after revascularization. So classically, the, the definition of hibernation is, is that you revascularize it and it gets better, but that's not what we're seeing, at least in Stitch and Revived. Now, the question is, why? Is this something about the patients? Is this that medical therapy has improved over time and now is better? Um, or is it something, a problem with the, the hypothesis? So again, kind of going back to why 
Um, sometimes we feel like Costanza with stable ischemic heart disease. And so in conclusion, and then just want to open it up to discussion, I think that I go back to that orbit of trial quote, because I really liked it, that, that, that maybe clinicians had hoped that, that there may be this simple entity named ischemia. And, and so when you go, when there's some fundamental instincts that we've had about ischemia, and maybe we just have to look to see if some of these things are right. So, you know, we have thought that ischemia testing could identify the patients that would get improved survival and then quality of life with revascularization. And we, but maybe that's not correct based on some of the data. And we thought that we could take a history and that could accurately identify the functional limitations due to ischemia. But it's challenging from, sometimes for us to really understand what symptoms are related to coronary disease and what symptoms are not. And we thought Diamond and Foster would give us accurate assessments of pretest probability, but it looks like uh, with time, it's been proven to be less accurate. And I think that really what's interesting, uh, going back to that, is that we thought that treatments that reduce ischemia would reduce non-fatal MI, which is probably true. And if we're reducing non-fatal MIs, that we probably, with time, reduce fatal MIs. And if we reduce fatal MIs, you would reduce the total mortality. But it's at least questioned based on of whether non-fatal MI is really measuring, at least today, how we measure it, a surrogacy of death. And maybe this has to do with the definitions that we use. And then finally, patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, we've, ha we've thought have a hibernating myocardium. We thought the LV dysfunction, the LV function would improve and mortality would improve after revascularization. So the question is, if some of these instincts are wrong, would the opposite be right? And so this is just to, for consideration, but what if we started with more treadmills and objective evidence for our patients and really exercise them um, as one of our first starting lines to look at their angina, look at their functional, functional limitations and for risk stratification, it's a cheap test that can be done in almost every office. You can add it on at any office visit. They don't have required pre-certification and it's something that's easy to do and can help us at least with giving us a little bit more objective evidence towards the patients that may benefit versus those that may not. And what if we added coronary CTA as our first line, or as our second line to this treadmill as the gatekeeper to the cath lab instead of using ischemia testing and that we could find the patients who need invasive angiography because of their anatomy, their left main disease, their multivessel disease, and the patients who want invasive angiography based on their, their single vessel disease or double vessel disease and their functional limitations. And if we, update, if we use updated pretest probabilities, we may come to different probabilities for coronary disease in the office. And I think that if we consider non-fatal MI, as we look at some of the data, as maybe a softer endpoint um, in clinical trials, we call it a hard endpoint, but maybe it's not so hard. Maybe it's a soft endpoint that's measuring something slightly different than what we thought it is. It may lead to differences in interpretations of a lot of our major clinical trials and some of our guideline recommendations, that if this is really measuring, at least as current, more hospitalizations, more, more revascularizations, more quality of life, it still doesn't mean it's not a good endpoint. It's a wonderful endpoint, but it just may, it may need a recalibration of what it's actually measuring. And finally, maybe we need to relook at the myocardial hibernation hypothesis. Certainly this data does not say that if this is wrong, these are two trials that are small to moderate, but it's interesting that they both go in the same, same direction, uh, stitched and revived. And so maybe for some patients, we need to consider a trial of medical therapy first, maybe a repeat echo before we routinely look for ischemia and think about revascularizations. It may lead to different revascularization decisions if we decide at time zero versus time time. 90 days or so, we may think we may look at that patient differently and decide differently about different, different treatments. And currently, I think based on at least the STITCH trial, the cabbage is the preferred revascularization strategy, but it's in, to improve 10-year survival in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathies. And I think we do need to remember that not all patients who are older or more comorbid, co comorbid uh, conditions may not derive that 10-year, you know, five to 10-year survival advantage. And if cabbage is an option, consider a selective approach to percutaneous revascularization. I don't think the REVIVE trial says that we should not do um, a revascularization, but I also think it doesn't say that we should do revascularization. And so we would want to just 
uh, individualize that. So with that, um, I will say thank you and open it up for questions. Clear as mud. Thank you. That was outstanding. You've given us a lot to think about this Monday morning. <laughs> um, just a few comments, Mike. You know, for you know, I live in the microvascular world, and so we've been thinking a lot about these concepts of angina. And you send people for stress test. It sounds like angina, but stress test is normal. What do I do? And then sounds like angina. Stress test is abnormal. I send them to cath, but no obstructive disease. So, you know, um, and I was looking at even after PCI, five-year endpoint, about 25 to 30% were still having angina. So what do we do, you know, what do we do with that? Um, so there are all these questions that are research questions that, uh, you know, I don't know how much of this is microvascular angina. I don't know, you know, if angina gets better, if you don't even treat it, if somebody has chest pain, they're stable. If you kind of just wait and not, let's do a stress test, let's look for something and just kind of say, okay, this was one time. Is it reasonable, would you say, to kind of say, you're not having episodes that are recurrent. This was a one-time thing. We're gonna monitor and let us know, you know, as opposed to, cause you, you're saying angina will get better. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I think that some of the data suggests that a lot of the angina improves with, no, with nothing. And, and now the question is why? In, in the, it could be A, it wasn't really angina and just it was chest pain yeah. and the chest pain resolved because it was chest pain. It could be B, it was microvascular disease. Um, uh, you know, but C, it, it, could be, it, it, it could be that it's really angina and then people then limit themselves and then they're not as symptomatic with time because they've limited themselves and they don't do what they used to do. And those, those three things can be really hard to tease out. But I think that in my opinion is that if we start by looking at their functional limitations, instead of jump straight to the ischemia testing that we may come, it's not that we shouldn't do ischemia testing. I'm, I'm not saying that microvascular disease may be a big part of this, but what if we start with the symptoms and start with the anatomy? We'll, we'll know in a non-invasive approach how much coronary disease they have and how much functional limitations they have. And then you can decide if you wanna add a non-invasive nuclear stress test to that. Um, so I think it's just switching the paradigm. I think we've, we've been ischemia focused and maybe we need to be symptom and anatomy focused. And a lot of those studies, I mean, they're used spec so there was no objective you know, flow reserve, so. I 100% agree, and I, 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 there's a lot of people who love PET, and so I'm just going to say that the data I said is all for spec, and I'll just leave it at that <laughs> to stay. Yes, yes, I'll just say the suspect data. So I have a comment and a question. So the first comment, when you say, well, we haven't done anything and angina goes away, you are still doing something, right? Those patients presumably are an optimo optimal medical therapy or at least on a statin and there are potentially long-term effects you know on flat stabilization etc the, the question is 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 i'm a like you a believer in in ct angios and stress tests but the question is what order to do them in um you say okay do a stress test and then decide whether to do your ct angio and that sort of assumes the stress test is sort of yay or nay, and we all know you stand there sometimes, yeah, you see a little ST elevation in stage two and you're like, or depression and you're, you're good and you know what you're doing. But lots of times, you know, you got bad baseline, you've got you know, all sorts of things. So what about the other approach? And that is to do the CCPA first, and plus you get a calcium score, you get some prognosis, and then if you have something, then you look at the functional. I think that's a great, great, question. And I, and I think that there's not a one size fits all. So there's probably plenty of times that CTA is very reasonable to start and then decide if you want to do a treadmill. So I think, yes, it's not a one size fits all, but, but I think the reason to think about treadmill first is, 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 is as much clinical as it is practical is that you can order a treadmill every day, any day. I mean, like almost every cardiology office has a treadmill and you can almost always fit your patient into that treadmill and you don't need to pre-certify them. And, and I think that they can 
um, actually lead to wonderful diagnoses. In fact, one of the patient populations that I think they're really great in is when I'm thinking about, do I need to do something today, like admit my patient to the hospital? Or are they safe to go home? I love to put them on the treadmill because there's sometimes that you'll find that you're, yes, you need to send them to the cath lab right now. And then there's other patients, the other times that you'll take that same same history and you're like, okay, I think this patient can go home and wait and get different testing. So the fact that you can do treadmills as an add-on test really in almost any office visit makes it, I think, the ideal first test for most people because it can lead to risk stratification, but not for every person. CTA does require prior authorization, and usually if you're going to order one and as an outpatient, it's going to be uh, 10 days to two weeks before it gets done. So, or, yeah. Well, the COVID test part of it, too. Yeah, it depends upon your COVID testing strategy and all that. I, I, I'll, yeah. Oh, Let's see. Let's see, Panda. Let's see. I... It's really blue and acting. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> yes. Rutan, yes, agreed. <laughs> so, uh, so Jerry. Uh, uh, so Jerry. Yes. <laughs> I'm Jerry. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I'm uh, hope, hoping you'll address me from here on as, as, as George, <laughs> because uh, I've spent my career being George, it looks like. Uh, I've, been, I've been accused uh, with introductions many times as a bit of hyperbole as the person who brought angioplasty to America. <laughs> so I'm clearly George. Uh, the uh, idea that from all, from all the guidelines, all the things we're seeing lately, and I've been reflecting on this too, uh, does, does bring you to the point of wondering if we're approaching the uh, 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 orthopedification of cardiology. Uh, if, if we had back pain, uh, what's our approach? It's very similar to what you're talking about. It's uh, you... Uh, Get the symptoms. How how bad is the back pain? Let's 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 get, and then you say, well, till till it gets bad enough, we're not going to do anything about it, and then uh, you may do a, a, a CT or MRI or something of your back and see if you can find some reason for this thing. Uh, with with cardiology, you know, what we do. Um, is very much uh, uh, George Costanza before he before he decided to do the opposite. Uh, we we are when I read the guidelines and when I talk about the guidelines, I have to say at the end, of it, well, take a look at your own what what you're doing, because it doesn't fit the guidelines. And I say that not believing that everybody is wrong, but wondering what what the studies are showing it. Is it possible that we've just never enrolled the patients who needed this therapy? Which is where I come back, because if, if you talk about this, you say, okay, bad ventricle, present it here to the group at Emory. Surgeons say, that, that, that's too bad. That's the ejection fraction is bad. Patient's high risk. STS score is way up here. And so what, what do we do? Well, multivessel disease. We've got to save the patient's life. We're going to do PCI stage. We'll do all these vessels. And we now have techniques. You can do all these things. And you see this fantastic, beautiful uh, result. If you take it back to the guidelines and you say, well, we did all these things. What have we done to the survival of this patient? And we would conclude, well, we've done nothing to the survival of the patient. But that's not at all what we believe. So our our, uh, I, I don't know whether the George, you know, before he decided to do the opposite or George <laughs> after he decided to do the opposite is the correct uh, George. I, I, that's a wonderful comment. And I, I completely agree with you. And I, and I, I think that sort of the, the two takeaways that one, I, I'm not sure that we're, our, our studies are the, are the right studies to begin with. I mean, Dr. King, you've probably said it more than anybody in our journal clubs. You know, we've done a PCI versus cabbage study. And you say, 
we'll use the MACE endpoint, was, was MACE the right endpoint for that trial? And so I think when you go back and you, if you recalibrate what non-fatal MI may be, you could easily come to a very different determination if you added up all the bad things that can happen to you at surgery and all the bad things that can happen to you at PCI and then came up with a different endpoint, you may come to a vastly different decision about what to do. So I agree with you that one, the trials may not have been set up right. And then two, maybe we've not put the right patients into the right trials. We don't know what the patients uh, uh, die of. Uh, we, uh, what, what the patients die of? They got coronary disease, we follow them. We get the report at the end of the trial, patient died. Uh, was it cardiac? Well, I've been on many of these uh, committees and you know, most of the time you can't tell what it was. Uh, sometimes you can, you, you make a guess if they died of a car wreck, you know it wasn't, or if they died of uh, terminal cancer, you know what, but otherwise you don't really know. Uh, the things that seem to kill people, as we know, are these, are events, are, are uh, cardiac events, which are many times, coronary occlusions or heart failure that results in arrhythmias. Uh, and, but, but I'm, I'm always frustrated that we don't really know what the patient died of. We no longer do autopsies. Uh, we no longer really uh, worry a lot. Uh, we never have CPCs. We never worry a lot about what, what really led to this final event. And, uh, and we know that the trials done early, you talk about, has had an effect. Trials later don't have as much of an effect. Well, I would submit that statins have a lot to do with that. Uh, you know, we now, you know, everybody is being treated, uh, not everybody, but the people with coronary disease have been treated to the max. And uh, so we've changed the outcome. We've changed the outcome. If you got severe coronary disease, you, you may survive. If you got severe spinal stenosis, you, it may get better. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an example of that. Uh, and where do you go with that? But when we look at our practice and way we we do what we do, and so we are aimed at finding it and fixing it. And so we just need to be reflective about that. I completely agree. And the only comment I would say is that if we if the population that came to us may we're we're based a little bit differently instead of based on ischemia testing, but more anatomy and, and symptoms that we probably are still gonna do a ton of revascularization. I believe in revascularization. I actually do think that there's probably survival despite everything I just showed. And I also believe in the myocardial hibernation hypothesis despite what I just showed. So there's a lot of people that I, that I would revascularize because I think it's survival advantage despite everything I just showed but it's a belief and it's not proven. And, and, but I just think that the, the difference is, is, is that I think that the way most people get to the cath lab in the United States is through ischemia testing and spec is the dominant strategy. And I think if we could flip that, that paradigm, that that might enrich the groups and we might see different results with our clinical trials. Hey, Mike, Mike. Yes. It's Peter Block. Hey, Dr. Uh, can Block. I, can I ask you just a quickie? Sure. Or maybe make a quick comment because I'm going to take on Spencer this one. Spencer said, you know what we do? We do what we do and we do it because we see coronary disease and we do it because we want to increase flow. Just for a moment, think about the idea that maybe increasing inflow has nothing to do with outcomes. And then in fact, by increasing inflow, we do very little and may actually be, do, do some harm by sending stuff downstream to where the action is, which is in the small vessels in the microcirculation. And I think the REVIVE trial tells us that increasing inflow flow has no effect on outcomes or little or for what that's worth. And I wonder whether just doing a stent in a proximal coronary artery because you think it's going to improve inflow, which it probably does, really has nothing to do with the syndrome that we're trying to treat. It's, I mean, it's an interesting question. I think that that's, that's, I think what it, I agree with you that like uh, the fundamental hypotheses of ischemic heart disease just need to be questioned. It doesn't mean that they're, the hypotheses are wrong, nor does it mean that they're right. 
Maybe we just need to figure out which parts of them are right and which parts we need to do better. Dr. Clements, I, I think he wants to say something. So, uh, uh, I'm impressed with your knowledge about all these trials, Mike. Number one. Number two, um, I like the terminology ischemic heart disease. I like the terminology better for chest discomfort due to myocardial ischemia, which would include a lot of things. And I, I don't like the term coronary artery disease because it doesn't include what Pooja is talking about with microvascular disease. It doesn't include uh, an anomalous coronary artery, Al Kappa, anything like that. So chest discomfort due to myocardial ischemia. Change the subject a minute. You remember what Andreas said about having an obstructed artery? He says, Better to have an open artery than a closed artery. That's just what he said. And uh, we're still trying to figure out whether or not that's right. We passed up many, many, many rights that are total that we incidentally find. And we're not passing them up so much now since Bill is around. <laughs> and Bill can open them up. And we're still kind of trying to figure out whether or not that's the right thing to do or not. Um, I can tell you that uh, if you revascularize somebody with an EF of 35%, it is possible that their ejection fraction will increase. And that's either with cabbage or with PCI. Now, the trial didn't show that that happened, but uh, it depends on the situation. I mean, you can look at viability with a PET scan and put it aside because that's negative. I just happened to see a patient the other day that they put that aside because that was negative. And in time, the EKG grew R waves in the precord. So it's, it's all a difficult, it's all a difficult area. Now, it is hard to say, uh, like you're gonna put them on the treadmill first if they're from Hay Hira. If they're from Hay Hara and you got one shot at them and you know a little bit about them from what the referring doctor told you, you may want to like skip the treadmill and do a nuke. If you do a CTA first, you give it an unknown person, a big load of contrast. You don't necessarily know on the spot what the creatinine is and there are difficulties there in making those decisions. So just a few comments about your great presentation. Well, thank, thank you. you. Oh, I, I completely agree with all those thoughts. Yeah. I... Well, Jerry, it was great. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is George again. Uh, if I'd known that Kramer was going to call in from Massachusetts, I might have said something different, uh, Peter. Uh, Kramer. <laughs> Oh, all right. Well, I think it's a late hour. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.